the hauntings of Willington Mill. During the last two months of 1834, the nursemaid employed by the Joseph Proctor family tried her best to ignore the eerie noises that she heard coming from the deserted room over the nursery. Each night when she was left alone to watch the children, she would hear the sounds, dull, heavy treading, like someone slowly pacing back and forth. Finally she decided that she had had enough of the strange sounds that so disturbed her sleep. She was convinced that a ghost occupied the upstairs room. In a state of nervous agitation, she asked to be discharged from her service in the Proctor home. Proctor saw no reason why he should attempt to talk the woman into staying with them. She was obviously a highly imaginative woman who had frightened herself by supposing that she was being visited by supernatural beings. It wasn't long, however, before he, and his wife and the other servants, also heard the sound of heavy feet in the upstairs room. Although puzzled by the treading of invisible feet, the proctors convinced themselves that there was undoubtedly a natural explanation for the strange sounds. In spite of their refusal to believe there was a supernatural element to the noises, the proctors purposely omitted any mention of the disturbed room when they hired a new nursemaid on January 23, 1835. On her first evening in the nursery, the girl came down to the sitting room to inquire who was in the room above her. The proctors evaded her question putting the whole matter down to the usual nightly noises of an old house. The next day, Mrs. Proctor heard the steps of a man with heavy boots walking about in the upstairs room. Later that same day, during the family's dinner, the nursemaid came down the stairs and blinked incredulously at Mr. Proctor. She said that she had heard someone walking in the room above her for five minutes. She had come downstairs to assure herself that it wasn't the master of the house. But if it isn't you, Sir, she inquired, who was it? Proctor inspected the room that night. Trickery seemed out of the question. The door to the room had been nailed shut for some time. The room's only window had been boarded up many years before with wooden laths and plaster. Inside the room, the floor was covered with a thin, undisturbed layer of soot which in itself was proof that not even a mouse had been walking about. Proctor descended even more mystified than when he had gone up to conduct his investigation. On January 31st, the Proctors heard a dozen loud thuds next to their bed as they were preparing to retire. During the next night, Joseph Proctor heard a metallic rapping on the baby's crib. There was a brief pacing overhead and then the sound of footsteps which were never heard again in the upper room. But what followed for the next several years included such a remarkable range of visual and auditory manifestations that the initial plodding footsteps were to seem like a baby's first steps in comparison. What is nearly as remarkable as the intense haunting of Willington Mill is the fact that the Proctors persisted in living in the house for over 11 years before finally surrendering to the paranormal disturbances that invaded their home. Thomas Mann the foreman of the mill that was separated from the Proctor's house by a road and a garden, told Proctor that he had heard a peculiar noise moving across the lawn in the darkness. At first, man thought it came from the wooden cistern that stood in the mill yard. He suspected that some pranksters were attempting to spill it. However, upon pursuing the noise with a lantern in hand, he found that the cistern had not been budged. Mann also told Proctor in the strictest confidence that even before this peculiar disturbance, he had on several occasions heard a sound as if someone were walking on the gravel path, but when he went to see who it was, he saw no one. Shortly after Proctor's confidential conversation with Mann, both Mann and another neighbor observed the luminous image of a woman in a window of Proctor's house. Both parties saw the ghost independently of each other. Man gathered his entire family to witness the phantasm, which was fully visible for more than ten minutes. About a year after the phenomena at Willington Mill had started becoming increasingly frightening, Mrs. Proctor's sister, Jane Carr, arrived for a stay. One evening, a few minutes before midnight, she was awakened by a noise very much like that of someone winding a large clock. After this bizarre noise, her bed began to shake, and she clearly heard a sound like that of a heavy sack falling on the floor above. Several strong knocks sounded about her bedstead, and the unmistakable sound of shuffling feet surrounded her bed. In addition to the sounds of thudding feet, 
the ghost had soon acquired fists with which to pound on walls and added bed lifting to its repertoire of supernatural phenomena. The invisible force manifested under the bed of the proctor's eldest child and began to raise the mattress higher and higher, until the child finally cried out. Next, the thing hoisted the mattress of the bed on which Mrs. Proctor and the new nursemaid were sleeping. Mrs. Proctor described the sensation as feeling as if a large man were underneath the bed pushing it up with his back. Later, the haunting developed an ability to whistle, talk, and materialize into a number of grotesque phantoms. The proctor's sons, Joseph and Henry, were awakened one night by a loud shriek that emanated from under their beds. Upon investigating, Joseph, Sr., heard an odd moan coming from somewhere in the room. One of the beds began to move, and the voice uttered what sounded like, Chuck Chuck. These sounds were followed by a noise similar to that of an infant sucking a bottle. The youngest child, Jane, was moved to another room, but her relocation did not spare her the torment of having her bed levitated. The phenomena had begun to leave its domain on the upper floor, venturing to the lower floors during the night. The kitchen seemed to be a favorite target for its nightly forays and on several mornings the cook would find the kitchen chairs heaped in a disorderly pile, the shutters thrown open, and utensils scattered about the room. Mrs. Proctor's brother, Jonathan Carr, spent the night filled with so much commotion that he declared he would not stay in the house for any amount of money. Jane, Mrs. Proctor's sister, was much more strong-nerved than her brother, judging from the journal that Joseph Proctor kept. The young woman spent many evenings in the afflicted house. One night as she shared a room with Mary Young, the cook, the two women were terrified to hear the bolt in their door slide back, the handle turn, and the door open. As an invisible entity moved across the bed the women shared, the bed curtains began to rustle, and the bed covers were suddenly lifted and thrown off the bed revealing the two trembling figures. Both women saw a distinctly dark shadow against the curtains that hung from the bed frame. Little Jane Proctor was sleeping with her Aunt Jane one night when she saw a strange head peeping out at her from the bed curtains. The four-year-old girl later described the head as being that of an old woman, but she became much too frightened to continue her observation and tucked her own head under the covers. Joseph, Jr was disturbed nearly every night by some facet or other of the phenomena. He reported hearing the words never mind and come and get being repeated over and over, without any apparent meaningful application. As he attempted to sleep, he constantly heard footsteps shuffling around his bed, and he both heard and felt forceful thumps to his pillow and other bedclothes. A medical doctor named Drury arrived and asked Proctor's permission to carry out an examination of the haunted upper room. Proctor consented and allowed the doctor and his companion, a young chemist, to make preparations to spend a night in the disturbed room. At about 1 a.m., Proctor was awakened by a piercing scream of terror coming from the upper floor. Drury had come face to face with the ghost of the wizened old woman. The two curious would-be investigators spent the rest of the night drinking coffee in the kitchen. They left the house at dawn. Proctor noted in his journal that the doctor and the chemist had received a shock that they would not soon forget. One of the most incredible materializations in Willington Mill was that of an entity resembling a monkey. One day eight-year-old Joseph. Jr., was seated atop a chest of drawers, pretending that he was making a speech to his sister, Jane, and his brothers Henry and Edmund, when his presentation was rudely interrupted. Suddenly, in full view of all the children, a monkey-like creature appeared and began to tug at Joseph's shoe strap. By the time Joseph, Sr., came running in response to their excited cries, the children were scurrying about the floor trying desperately to play with the mischievous monkey. Two-year-old Edmund, the youngest Proctor child, continued to look under chairs and tables until his bedtime, trying to locate the entity that he identified as a funny-looking cat. Years later, the memory of that incident was still vivid in Edmund Proctor's mind. In the December 1892 issue of the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research, he wrote, now it so happens that this monkey is the first incident in the lugubrious hauntings, or whatever they may be termed, of which I have any recollection. I suppose it was, or might easily be, the first monkey that I had ever seen, 
which may explain my memory being so impressed that I have not forgotten it. My parents have told me that no monkey was known to be owned in the neighborhood, and that after diligent inquiry no organ man or hurdy-gurdy boy, either with or without a monkey, had been seen anywhere about the place or neighborhood, either on that day or for a length of time. I have an absolutely distinct recollection of that monkey and of running to see where it went to as it hopped out of the room and into the adjoining room. We saw it go under the bed in that room, but it could not be traced or found anywhere afterwards. We hunted and ferreted about that room, and every corner of the house, but no monkey, or any trace of one, was more to be found. Aunt Jane Carr did not see the monkey, but she reported that she had heard what sounded like an animal jumping down off an easy chair. The white face of what appeared to be an old woman was seen more and more often, but Joseph, Jr., soon added an old man to the list of materializations. One of the more astonishing visual materializations also occurred to the younger Joseph. The hunting force fashioned a double of the young boy. Imagine the boy's shock upon discovering his mirror image peeking at him from the shadows beside his bed. He was about ick, years old when this facet of the phenomena manifested, so his powers of observation must be given some credence. Joseph, Jr., said that his spectral self-image, which was even dressed in a manner identical to his, walked back and forth between the window and the wardrobe before it gradually dematerialized. Shortly after this dramatic episode, the proctors decided that they had endured enough. Patient Quakers though they were, I won years of living amidst incessant supernatural disturbances had been enough for them. They had also become fearful that the plague-ridden dwelling would inflict permanent injury to the minds of their children. In 1866 Proctor obtained a residence at Camp Villa, North Shields, and after completing the arduous task of packing their belongings, he and his wife sent the servants and the children on ahead to their new residence. Mr. and Mrs. Proctor stayed behind, alone, to properly close up the house. Their final night in Willington Mill was perhaps the most frightening of all. The constant sound of heavy thuds prevented them from getting any rest at all. The house echoed with the sound of boxes being dragged down the stairs, but the house was empty, save for them. All of their boxes had been moved out earlier that day. Yet they continued to hear footsteps walking across the floors, dragging invisible furniture. The proctors were, in effect, hearing a ghostly reenactment of all the noises made by the family and their servants as they were engaged in their various moving chores. The proctors wondered with some panic if the ghosts were packing in order to move with them to the new house. It was with indescribable relief that the proctors arrived at the new residence to find it completely free of the former horror that had blemished eleven years of their lives. Their residency in the new home was blissfully untroubled by knockings, whistlings, footsteps and phantasms. After the proctors moved from Willington Mill, the house was divided into two apartments. According to later testimonies of the new occupants, only the occasional haunting phenomena occurred. However, in approximately 1868, when two new families moved into the apartments, they were so greatly disturbed by ghostly manifestations that one family moved out and refused to return. After a number of years had passed, the mill was closed and made into a warehouse, and the old Proctor house was divided into a number of small tenements. When Edmund Proctor visited the place around 1890, none of the tenants claimed to be troubled by ghosts. It appeared that whatever ethereal beings had plagued the house at Willington Mill had moved on. 